Yeah. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, thank you for the action that you will take or have already taken in this moment. Um, and thank you for <laughs> thank you for showing up. Thank you for showing up in your rage, um, your grief, your love, um, your readiness. And I also want to send particular love and gratitude to folks showing up on this call who identify as Black. We're gathered on um, this call tonight because our country is in a moment of reckoning and uprising around the murders of Black people every day in our communities at the hands of police. And now, <laughs> sweeping the country, we're seeing more and more people talking about defunding the police. For a lot of people, talking about defunding the police might seem out of this world or really unrealistic, much like the Green New Deal. But also like the Green New Deal, defunding the police is our only shot at a livable future, a future where Black people in this country can go jogging, play with Nerf guns, or sleep in their own bed without fear of getting shot. Defunding the police means investing in Black human life and dignity. It means creating jobs in our communities that address conflict in a regenerative, peaceful, and restorative way. We need to stop investing in what kills our communities. Um, police, jails that lock our family members up, polluting oil refineries, fracking, pipelines. Um, we need to stop investing in what causes pain and punishment and start investing in what allows communities to thrive. Healthcare, education, jobs for all, affordable, clean housing, fresh air and water. Many of these ideas we've talked about as, our, as part of a just and equitable Green New Deal. The way our government does not value Black lives is related to climate change directly. If Black lives mattered to those in power, we wouldn't have built refineries and pipelines in Black and Brown communities, and we would have woken up to reality after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. We're here on this call today to dig into what it actually means to defund the police, why it's so urgent, and how it's connected to the Green New Deal. We'll talk about how this moment is an unprecedented opportunity to change the common sense, and then we'll get into do what you can do right now. This moment is like nothing we've ever seen before, and it's time for our movement to throw down with everything we've got to build a better world. And I'm gonna pass it to Aru to say more. Great, thank you so much, Abby. My name is Aru. Um, I'm the trainings director for Sunrise and I, yeah, I'm, I'm actually from Minneapolis. I grew up there, I was raised there all my life. So I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about, um, yeah, how this has been hitting home for me and uh, yeah, what's been going on there. Honestly, if you had told me just like <laughs> three weeks ago that we would be in the middle of having a national debate about defunding the police, I just wouldn't have believed it. But that's where we're at and it's really exciting. And I wanted to share a little bit about how we actually got to this place. So, like I said, I'm from Minneapolis, um, and I'm from around eight blocks uh, where the police precinct is. I, uh, yeah, I like grew up there. I would walk by it all the time when I went to my dance lessons or when I went to like my YWCA. And I remember when I was around 14 years old, um, I was in the train station, like a block away from the police station. Um, and I saw this man collapse on the ground who looked like he had um, like was on the verge of overdosing in some ways. And I remember approaching him and checking in with him being like, what's, what's going on? Like, is there anything I can do? Should I call anyone? And, um, and he just started like begging me not to call the police because he was so scared that calling the police would mean that he would be sent to jail, that he had made like, yeah, that he uh, was, was really scared. And that meant that he couldn't even get the medical help that he needed. So I was left with this man um, who was worried about overdosing and sitting like on, on the train station uh, with the police only one block away at the police precinct. And when an officer walked by and like, like tried to ask if everything was okay, I just remember like 
lying to him and being like, yeah, it's all fine, getting him to move on, because I just had no trust that that the police, the police officers would be able to actually help the people who, who were in need. And that like was my relationship to police in that neighborhood growing up like that uh, was how I, I knew police would interact with my, my community. So when all of this started happening, um, I, like I had seen throughout my whole life, like police moving homeless people like out of bus shelters in the winter uh, where that was the only place where they could stay warm. I knew something was wrong with my city when I saw like the, the murder of Jamar Clark, the murder of Philando Castile when I saw the occupation of the governor's mansion in reaction to those deaths. So Minneapolis was, was ready, and I knew when, when I saw George Floyd's murder on, on video that my city was just like not going to stand for it again. And I remember thinking in particular uh, about a, a project that I had seen in 2017. In 2017, it was the 150th anniversary of the Minneapolis Police Department, the MPD, and a group formed to conduct a 150-year review of the department. And they documented years upon years of racist history, attempted reform, and horrific incidents. And I actually just wanted to share a few of their findings of their research. Cormac, could you share this slide for me? Thanks. They basically reviewed this 150 years of history and they realized that like the police were established to protect the interests of the wealthy and of racialized violence had always been a part of that mission. That we had tried reform again and again and again and again, uh, but the police could not be reformed away from their core function. That the police criminalized dark skin and poverty, channeling millions of people into the prison system, depriving them of voting and employment rights, and thereby preserving privilege uh, that, like to housing, jobs, land, credit, and education for white people. That the police militarize and escalate situations that call for social service intervention and that there are viable existing and potential alternatives to policing for every area in which policing engage. So that's, that's what like MPD 150, this project found. Uh, and I remember reading that a few years ago and when everything started happening, uh, I felt so, so proud of my city for actually being able to recognize the horrific violence that was taking place um, and rise up in this really, really new way. Um, and when and the, the whole city was was ready to rise and you all know what happened next the entire neighborhood erupted into protest communities came together in amazing ways organizing food banks to replace coal grocery stores setting up neighborhood patrols since the police weren't protecting them and when Derek Chauvin was arrested and then later charged with second degree murder the protest didn't stop. Instead, Black Visions Collective uh, launched a campaign to push city council and the mayor to end piecemeal reform and do the only thing that would put a stop to this, actually defunding the police. And so on Sunday, like four or five days ago, nine out of the 13 people on city council actually voted to dissolve the Minneapolis Police Department. Now, we know that defunding the police is not the solution in and of itself, but it is the first step in a much larger conversation that examines what community protection and service actually looks like. I just want to add that the idea of defunding the police is not new. It's been around for a while. I can promise you it's been done. It's been studied. It's been dreamed about. It's been written about. It's been drawn about. And now it is finally work, breaking its way into the public consciousness. And it is because of the hard work of organizers. Just like the people in Minneapolis were able to take this from this being like a fringe idea to having their city council vote to defund the police, we can do that in cities and towns across the country. And social movements are the only thing that can get us there. So we are going to spend today digging into what actually defunding the police is, what it actually looks like, what the vision of the future could be, and what the role of social movements in is and how we can plug in. And with that, I'm going to pass it to AG. Can you see me? Hey, everybody. Um, so excited to be in this conversation with you all tonight. Um, I think it's really important that we start by actually grounding what is policing in the United States of America. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about history, but I just want to actually get us started with the concept of it itself um, and start with a quote that came from Critical Resistance, a group that's been moving towards abolition um for decades uh founded by angela davis and several other powerful folks out in california has really been grounding this conversation 
I say that to again remind folks that this isn't a new conversation. Um, so um, according to critical resistance, policing is a social relationship made up of a set of practices that are empowered by the state to enforce law and social control through the use of force, reinforcing the oppressive social and economic relationships that have been central to the U.S. throughout its history. The roots of policing in the United States are closely linked to the capture of people escaping slavery and the enforcement of black codes. Similarly, police forces have been used to keep new immigrants in line and to prevent the poor and working classes from making demands. As social conditions change, how policing is used to target poor people, people of color, immigrants, and others who do not conform on the street or in their homes also shifts. The choices policing requires about which people to target and what to target them for and when to arrest them play a major role in ultimately who gets in prison. And that's really important to ground in because from its inception, policing in America has been racially violent and through its continuation has been violent. Um, we don't just need to look at the relationship that exists in black communities. We can look to examples like Harlan County, Virginia, West Virginia, where people in unions were, or where people were fighting for unions and were bulldozed literally by the police. We can look in places like Philadelphia back in the 80s, where the police literally dropped a bomb in a residential neighborhood because of a group of people who wanted to live autonomously. We can look to today and see how its historical um, practice has become its popular policy in this moment. So we can start by looking at where's policing start in America? Policing is actually not like this ultimate thing that's always existed. It's really like less than a thousand years old, which in the span of human history ain't really that long. Um, and when it comes to America, is first most notably known in the 1600s. And that is when the slave patrols start. So as the translated slave trade persists, people are deputized into making sure that slaves who are attempting to escape are captured and brought back to their quote unquote owners. This becomes codified in law in the late 1600s and early 1700s. And when the nation is formed, there are actually militias and paramilitary forces across the South whose explicit purpose is checking to make sure that Black people are where they're supposed to be. They can provide paperwork and documentation for who they belong to or if they are free. Um, and, to, uh, and to mitigate, um, or sorry, not mitigate, that's not even the right word, to navigate people who haven't paid their debts. That is literally what policing is at the founding of this country. And we see decade after decade after decade, policing policies written explicitly around poverty and around black people. And so making sure that there is a form and mechanism from keeping people from escaping slavery or remembering their place when slavery is ended. This is a, a really violent history. Um, when you talk about uh, sheriffs literally corralling people into town squares for public lynchings, when we're talking about um, the reign of terror that you see around um, Klansmen actively being a part of local police forces across the South. And then we get to the war on drugs in the 70s with Nixon and this idea of law and order. And that's when we see the most clear example of how we got here. Policing wasn't this well-funded thing in most of America um, until the 70s. But at the national level, uh, Nixon introduces in a set of policies that are, again, specifically targeted towards Black people, poor people, and immigrants to focus on trying to reclaim the narrative away from the Black power movement and the hip, uh, hippies of the 60s. When you go back and uh, look at interviews from people who were instrumental in that time period. This is their own words. This isn't hyperbole. This is actually what they dictate as a reason for those policies. And it becomes politically advantageous to be tough on crime. So once we get into the 80s, 
we notice that Democrats are having a difficult time talking about this idea of law and order and are losing political races. What happens? Clinton emerges. And Clinton is rise to fame and popularity is bolstered in large part by the idea that he will clean up decaying urban centers in a way that no Democrat ever will. And he, and in particular, he and Joe Biden go on a multi-year crusade at the legislative level to increase funding nationally for police. If you watch the uh, Last Week Tonight segment, um, from John Oliver, his goal was we need 150,000 new officers in the street, 150,000 new officers in the street, 150,000 new officers in the week. And the consequence of that in the 94 crime bill, the 96 immigration bill, and subsequent policies is, is you see this massive ballooning in the idea of the police state. You see a militarization of police with their equipment. Um, and you see a huge increase in the prison population. So we go from a country with about 700,000 people in jail at the end of the 70s to over 2.5 million people in the carceral system today. So um, I, I see some fun things happening in this chat um, about what is a police state. It seems like it's not just a communist state that can be a police state, but we actually exist in one in America, no matter what your political orientation is, no matter what your political orientation is, the actual unmitigated fact that police and prisons in this country are violent institutions and that we have been funding them to the extent that we don't fund education, social work, mental health services. We've asked the police to take on roles in society that fundamentally they are not prepared or equipped to hold. Which brings us to the idea of defunding the police. And I'm not sure if we have a PowerPoint up. I was hoping somebody could read from a slide. Fantastic. Um, we are going to uh, take this opportunity for someone to put their hand up and read from this slide. If, and I mean if, you are a person who is acting in bad faith, you will be knocked off of the webinar and we will go on ahead and read it ourselves. So I'm gonna invite somebody to raise their hand you will be unmuted and we'll read this quote out. All right, Bridget. Are you unmuted? Go for it. Bridget. Doing what? I didn't say yes. No, I'm saying she can back out of the queue. I mean, that's how long it takes you to find a match that fits you. But I did it. Okay, let's try Paige. How about you? Paige, you should be unmuted. Okay. Many people are more afraid of imagining a world without police than one without prisons. This seems especially true for people who consider themselves to be progressive. I don't have the time, energy, or inclination to write in depth about abolishing the police right now but I've been asked a lot for resources on the topic. To be honest, I'm crabby about offering those too. This is because what people usually mean by resources is a step-by-step -step guide or program. Well, that doesn't exist because building a world without police is actually a collective project that will also mean that many, many other things will need to change too. That's not a satisfying answer for people who don't actually want to think, and most importantly, who think it's other people's responsibility to come up with alternatives. The reason why I think it's important to share that quote is because we're asking people to do something that by and large we relegated to the responsibility of others. And that's to figure out what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world of people with in cages, a world where we continue to see our brothers and sisters murdered in the street? Or do we actually want to fight for peace? Do we actually want to fight for justice? We can't just be saying these things at a protest. If we genuinely believe that justice and peace are possible, then we have to be willing to come into community together and find solutions. 
the idea around defunding the police is not new. And there are actually some policy steps that we can be taking right now to move us towards the future. But it also means that we're asking for real responsibility in making this democracy work and making this republic work and making our communities work. And we're talking about a long-term conversation for how we build a truly humane and just system that treats us all with dignity. That's not dissimilar from what we're doing with the Green New Deal. In fact, it is the same fight. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what defunding the police is and what defunding the police isn't. It's important to recognize that there's actually kind of like two different factions in the public discourse, three different factions. Um, there are ultranationalists, which if you look up the word fascism is what fascism is defined by, um, who believe that a paramilitary force that can have all the ability to act violently and no accountability to that violence should exist writ large. I'm sure there are some people on this call who represent that point. We're not really here to convince those folks. Hey, that's you, okay. What we are in the conversation around is another group of people who think that you can reform the system to make it work, despite the fact that we have decades of reforms and the same problem, and a group of folks who are really fighting to see a new vision born for what justice looks like. Again, this idea of justice ain't that old in the tens of thousands of years of our human existence. And so we need to stop believing that it's natural. And we need to, again, reinvest in the idea that a better world is possible. So um, we, I think Sunrise, I, I speak right now as a member of Sunrise, believe uh, that at a fundamental level, uh, police are racist and that their purpose is not to protect, protect and serve, but ultimately to protect profit and property. Um, and want to start beginning to take non-reformist reforms that help end that fundamental relationship between the police and community. So what does that look like when we're asking about defunding the police? We're asking questions like, does reducing funding to police challenge the notion that police lead to safety? Do the tools and tactics that police use actually benefit the problems that they're being asked to solve. Case in point, everyone in the world has seen police officers talk to homeless people. And yet, what is the solution? Are the police really equipped to be helping in that regard? Or should we be investing in people, policy, and programs that actually end houselessness in this country? Um, so we want to reduce the scale of policing. We want to reduce the ways in which communities are accountable to show up for one another. That this isn't somebody that you're just calling in uh, to, to, to help resolve a problem, but that we're actually accountable to the problem that exists itself. And we want to actually just present, before we go into this next piece, um, sort of a framework to abolition as we see it. So a lot of folks have heard about the campaign, Eight Can't Wait. Again, these are a lot of um, reforms that are supposed to end 72% uh, of deaths by policing. A lot of cities have already adopted these police reforms and yet people continue to die. But more fundamentally, we believe that 100% of police deaths should be ended. That police officers shouldn't be killing anybody. Um, and that ultimately, if we are truly striving for a society of peace and justice, then we need to be focusing on what gets us to that society, not arming people to kill folks that we think are a threat to it. Um, so it starts with defunding the police. It continues with demilitarizing communities, ending the surveillance state of our communities. Again, for the ultranationalists who are on the call who might be called fascists, Y'all seem to be pretty preoccupied with surveillance as well. So there seems to be some alignment here. Removing police officers from schools. Kindergartners should not have to go into schools every day where they see the first person that they see is someone with a gun and handcuffs. How will children ever feel safe? We wanna see people freed from cages. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard that little eyes of an angel commercial about dogs in cages. Why are we so comfortable with people in them? We want to repeal laws that criminalize survival. Florida is a key um, state, I, I live in Florida, where the threshold for a felony is as low as it can possibly get. I think it's something like $200 or $300. And so if you end up taking something like someone's cell phone while you're in a class, um, you don't give it back. There are kids who have actually been thrown in jail and have felony convictions now because of childish behavior in high school. We wanna see communities invested in self-governance. We wanna provide safe housing for everyone. And we wanna make sure fundamentally that we are investing in care, not just people with guns and fancy military equipment. Um, this is sort of the basic framework for what we're talking about when we say defund police. That instead of accepting violent institutions, that we are actively moving towards peace and justice in our society. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to AOK, talk a little bit more about what visioning that society can look like. Thank you, AG. Right on. Wow, that was, that was a lot <laughs> to follow. Uh, I'm Alex O'Keefe. I'm the creative director of Sunrise. So, as AG explained, defunding is step one, but let's imagine a world without police. I joined Sunrise early on because I saw the echoes of the Black Freedom Movement and the Green New Deal's job guarantee. The Black Panther's second demand of their 10-point program was to free Black people in America was a job guarantee. It's the same job guarantee demand made by MLK and Jesse Jackson. And honestly, at a time of massive unemployment, we have given cops too many jobs. Cops are supposed to be expert drivers, marriage counselors, executioners, action heroes. We need a job guarantee to create special forces to actually protect and serve the people in our communities. Hire public drivers, pay everyone a good living. Train therapists who specialize in domestic violence, shelter the poor, feed everyone any night of the week in neighborhood kitchens. We don't need cops. We need to give everyone everything they need. It's not that complicated, right? And we know that. We've known that since we started this Green New Deal fight. And right now I'm seeing stores boarded up for looting. And it reminds me of scenes from my home in Florida during hurricane season, boarded up grocery stores. Instead of serving people, they protected food and supplies from desperate people. Poor families like mine turned to our neighbors, turned to our church to take care of us. What if the government invested in mutual aid, right? My family's refrigerator was ruined by a lightning strike during a hurricane. We ate out of a cooler all summer. We starved and I stole food to get by and I got arrested and I went to jail, and I paid huge fines for going to jail. There was a cop to deal with a problem that a refrigerator repair person could have solved. There'd be no crime if my family had the money, if our appliances and our electrical system were retrofitted to survive storms. So when we say defund the police and invest in communities, that's what we, need. That's what we mean. And the second part is so important. I am what happens when one black kid gets out of poverty, gets a good job. I'm about 15% free. And that allows me to be visionary in this work. Everyone is innately creative. Everyone has dreams. I don't care if every moment of your life, you just dream of owning a jet ski. When you go to sleep, you are like Franz Kafka. You are like David Lynch. You are a surrealist. You dream of the wildest potentials when you're not surrounded by the structures of your everyday life. So as we tear down these structures of white supremacy, as each chain snaps, like floss, as we find momentum, we find hope. Yes, that is hope you feel. Don't be afraid of it. You owe it to Fred Hampton and Angela Davis, whoever your revolutionary is, you owe it to them. We deserve to revel in the potential of this moment. Hope is a radical form of labor. It challenges all of us not just to consider another world, but consider ourselves within it. How would it work? How would it change our work? And when the public imagination expands, as it has in the past week, we need to weave together the visions and the plans of millions of people to fill in those blanks. We need to build those structures. And it reminds me of last year, Sunrise Movement partnered with organizers at Iowa CCI to host a community visioning session for the Green New Deal. We brought together farmers and indigenous leaders and union leaders, train conductors, prison abolitionists, yes, nurses were in the house, and we just asked them to imagine what their Iowan towns would look like transformed by the decade of the Green New Deal. We actually made it into an animated video you can watch, you can watch now. We, one of the most powerful moments of the day was when we played this role-playing game that we created called Working Together. It was kind of like Green New Deal Dungeons and Dragons. 
Each person picked a role, a job of the future, healer, scientist, farmer, communicator, and we gave each team six scenarios. And each player had to use their turn, use their skills to help solve the problem that we gave them. And then the next player built off their teammate solution with their own effort. And I saw these people from across race and class just get it, understand that they had a part to play. That is what we need to do. We need to rekindle the, the public imagination in this country. We need visioning sessions across the country. We need new civic structures that call upon people's imagination and creativity and curiosity to plan their own communities. Not a corporation designing it, you designing it with your neighbors, learning a little bit about them along the way. That is what organizing is, and it has brought me so much life. So we're talking a lot about hope. Let's talk about fear, because I just want us to be honest and vulnerable about this, right? Honestly, many of us on this call were not police abolitionists last month, right? It's okay. We can admit it. Most of us, I would expect none of us, predicted this uprising happening right now. And maybe you have fear. This is surprising. Maybe you're thinking, what if I need police for this or that? How could it all go wrong? And to build with hope, we need to be honest about our fears and find real answers for each one. So I would love if people could just share in the chat right now, what are some fears, just be honest, you have about a world without police? Yeah, these are real. These are perfectly valid fears, right? The, the thing is, is that police are not the answer. Police have not solved mass shootings so far, have they? My, my college in Tallahassee, a mass shooter went there because we just react and react and react. So our fears are valid, but we gotta know that the right wing will seize upon them to discredit our movement, to discredit the defund the police movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and yes, to discredit the Green New Deal. That's how they attack the Green New Deal. That's how they've always attacked us. And honestly, this is not going to work. If you don't call the cops, will we protect our big screen TV with an assault rifle? We need to find new answers for our fears, nonviolent answers. You know, in the, in the 60s, radicals had this, uh, this quote, there was a policeman inside all of our heads and he must be destroyed. And we have, to, we have to remove that thing that makes us judge each other, that makes us fear each other. Um, and we have to start imagining what it would like, like if we just went and tried to help somebody instead. Imagine someone is behaving erratically, they're in harm's way. You text 311, an unarmed urgent responder, trained in mental health, comes within five minutes. Those cops aren't trained in mental health. I've seen this happen before with cops. They abuse the people. Imagine someone nonviolent. Imagine you might be experiencing domestic violence. You text 311 and a trauma-informed responder meets you in a safe place. An hour later, you are working together to make a plan that will keep you safe long-term. And you know what? Maybe, just maybe, you have that kind of financial independence that you can feel free to leave a toxic situation. You have that ability. It's the economics in part that trap people in these tough situations. And if you don't believe that alternative is possible, find a way to believe in yourself, in your friend who's marching and the UPS driver passing out water bottles out of his van window. Believe in the people, because we are the workers. We are the builders. We are the wrecking crew of killer structures. We are the destroyer of murder machines. So let a new world be born from our bricks. Wow. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I want to be really clear. This is an opportunity like we haven't seen in decades. It's the first time we've actually seen a national conversation about the government's priorities like this. And we're seeing millions take to the streets, demanding that the government value education, healthcare, and clean air and water over police and violence. But we've only got to this point because of social movements and will only emerge because of social movements as well. 
This means that seizing this moment and connecting it to a longer vision about what the, about the world that we're fighting for. Um, defunding the police is the first step towards a society where we can all live without fear. It's the only way we can get to a Green New Deal. And it's only gonna happen if we organize. One thing I wanna note here, um, if you're a non-Black person, it can feel really tricky to figure out what it means to both own your own leadership, as well as knowing to follow local Black leadership in your area. Has anyone else, I know I've felt this a lot where I am in Philly. Can you drop in the chat if you've, if you've also felt that way? Yeah. Well, it's essential that you reach out to Black-led community organizing groups, if any exist in your town. Um, but often showing up and asking like, what should I do? <laughs> is ultimately putting more work on Black organizers who are already really strapped and exhausted. Often it's more helpful to approach with a sense of, here's what my Sunrise Hub can offer, or here's what I can offer as individual. Is it helpful? That offering could look like organizing an action, targeting an elected official, playing a specific role in an action already being planned, or anything else that makes sense in your local context. I also wanna say that while communicating and building relationships is really important, things are really busy for organizers right now. And you shouldn't automatically let the absence of explicit instruction from Black-led groups prevent you from taking strategic action as long as you are as sure as you possibly can be that you're in alignment with local campaigns and demands. More than anything, um, I think the, <laughs> just the most important thing is that what's not an option right now is doing nothing. As a movement, we cannot let paralysis or fear of messing up stop us from fiercely showing up in this moment. The stakes are too high and the movement needs every single one of us. Um, and I wanna pass it to Nikita, who is um, one of our partners, at the Movement for Black Lives, to talk a little more about what that looks like. Hey, good evening, good evening, y'all. Um, it is such an honor to be present with the Sunrise Movement. Um, you all are literally activating tens of thousands of young people to ensure that folks like me and my four-year-old son have a planet to live on that is healthy and not extracted upon. So I wanna begin by saying thank you for the work that y'all are doing. I'm just really deeply, deeply appreciated. My name is Nikita Mitchell. I am with a multiracial coalition called the Rise Majority, which was born out of the movement for Black Lives. And I'll be speaking about the Juneteenth action, yeah? So as y'all know, across the country, led by Black communities and organizers, people have been turning the hell up in response, first and foremost, to the terror we face at the hands of police brutality, but also beginning to make connections between how police brutality is in deep relationship to the protection of capital, is in deep relationship to extractive economies, and is in deep relationship to white supremacy, right? So folks are, yes, going out and organizing, honoring the names of many of those um, who have been deeply impacted um, and have lost their lives to police, but are also connecting that to issues that impact all of our daily lives, yeah? The Movement for Black Lives, which is um, a coalition of over 150 Black-led Black organizations have been supporting local efforts. So we know what movement energy is like, yeah? So folks have hit the streets, um, folks have started to turn up and Movement for Black Lives have been helping to cohere, been helping to resource and support those efforts while also helping to build and leading the building of a united front effort to defund police and fund the people. Um, we are turning up this weekend, the weekend of Juneteenth, so the 16th through the 21st, three days with different messaging and tactics for everyone to engage in. Um, we are bringing together 50,000 folks to DC, as well as taking action digitally and locally. 
Um, for folks who know, Juneteenth is a historical day for Black folks. It marks a day of resilience and resistance. Um, and we want to and we will be organizing in that effort, yeah, in that legacy. And we're organizing around two demands. And I see that my, my comrade, um, Chinetti is online, who's also going to be speaking very specifically around the actions. Uh, but we're organizing around two demands. First, ooh, it came up large screen for me. I love it. Okay, so first, right, we are calling for the defund of police and funding the people across the nation um, and in federal budgets, right? We connect this to the fight as well to defund ICE, detention centers, and all other forms of militarized forces. We understand, I believe someone was talking about this as I got on, right, that there is a direct relationship to the money that go to police, like the $850 million that went to public safety in the midst of a pandemic, and the lack of quality education systems, lack of employment and jobs, and also defunding of climate and environmental systems that will ensure we have a healthy planet. Those things are directly connected. And so we're calling for a defund of the police and actually an investment in people. And in addition to that, community control over that investment, yeah? The second thing that we're calling for is we want to call for the resignation of Donald Trump. And one of my comrades said, we're calling for the resignation now. And if he's still in by November, we're calling for the retirement. Either way, he has to go. Yeah. So we're calling for the resignation of Donald Trump. We see him as a figurehead of white supremacy and racial capitalism. He is an adequate leader that has time and time again deprioritized the people, deprioritized the planet. And moving forward, we actually can't take that risk. Yeah, we actually need a different set of conditions to fight within. And so we're calling for his resignation. We're calling for his retirement. And thirdly, um, this is not on here, but we also want to make sure that we're supporting local DC efforts, right? We know that the defund fight, we know that the investment fight is not new. Folks have been organizing around that for a long time. I'm from Oakland, California. And so I resonate with this. And so we want to make sure that when we bring in 50,000 folks to the streets, we're also supporting the local infrastructure and making sure we're moving, uh, so helping to support transformative action that's going to leave a different set of conditions to organize in than when we came. Yeah. And so th that's kind of like the, the intention It's what we're going to be about doing in Juneteenth. Um, and I really look forward to it and I'm excited by the ways in which y'all see yourselves connected to that fight um, and connected to this action and mobilization. I'm gonna pass it to Chinetti who can speak a little bit more directly about the, the actual uh, weekend itself. Hey y'all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for having me on the call today. Super excited to be here. Um, so we're going to talk about what we're calling for specifically, right? So we know that during that weekend, we want people to take action. People have been taking action for the last few weeks out in the streets, whether it was through spontaneous actions, organized actions, small communities, large communities. We've seen some of the largest marches and largest actions we have seen in generations. So we know that people are out there, right? And we want that to continue. We want to invite people to take action with us during that weekend. And they can do so at home. There will be ways to take action at home and because we understand that we are in the middle still of a global pandemic. We want people to take action in their communities. If they are organized, local folks that are connected to local, local demands and local campaigns, we are not trying to pull energy away from that by pulling people to DC, but we want to encourage people to move into action during that weekend locally. And for those who are looking for a space to mobilize, that are looking for a political home, that are looking for connection in a different way, then we are inviting you to join us in DC during Juneteenth weekend. 
right? And what will take place during that weekend is we will spend, we will take each of the demands that Nikita laid out and we will spend a day being able to really talk about it, go into it, but also learn what does this mean? How do we give skills to people when they go back home? How are we giving tools to folks and being able to lift, lift up some of the local wins that have happened on a national stage? It is not just the time to hear from celebrities or to hear from those who have influence, but it is the time to hear from from local organizers about what they've been doing, how they can win, and how we can all get involved. So that's what we're inviting folks into. We will also, on Saturday night in DC, be doing a memorial service for all those who have been killed by police violence, all Black people who have been killed by police violence, as well as those who've been killed by COVID. Because we understand in this country that we are still in, a, in deep shock in deep mourning and have not had time to collectively grieve, collectively be together in that way. And we know that when we look at the numbers, there are so many that have been killed that are people of color. There are so many that have, who have died who are Black people. So we want to, we understand that systematic violence looks so many different ways. So we will use that as an opportunity to honor those people. Um, and then, as Nikita said, we will move to the White House because we know that there are white supremacists in that house, but there are also white supremacists in houses all across the country that are in seats of power that it's time for us to uproot. So we're asking people to continue to get involved and to continue to take action with us during that weekend. Thank you so much, Tim and Nikita. I, yeah, I feel so excited to take action on Juneteenth. And Cormac, could you actually pull up the slide real quick so everyone has the, the link? You can just go ahead and right now type um, 619.com into your browser or wherever it is that it'll pop up a little pledge and you can give your information right away. You can sign up to volunteer. You can sign up to like host your, uh, host your own and you can do it right now. And whenever you've done that, let's have people put a heart in the chat. So uh, the people are putting in the chat right now and I'm going to ask people to sign up um, and take this pledge. Yes, I'm seeing these hearts rolling in and the, the link is keeping coming too. Great. It's a super short form, so if you haven't done it already, I would encourage you to. It'll take you like two seconds. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Maybe like 30 seconds. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, um, while people keep filling that out, I am going to jump into the other thing that we, that is like really, really important in this moment. Um, Tim, you said this line right as you were ending about like, it is time for us to, oh, I'm going to start my video. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, you were talking about how it is time for us to uproot people like white supremacists out of their seats of power. Um, and I've really been thinking about that a lot lately. I remember in like I said earlier, I'm from Minneapolis. Um, in 2017, I remember going door knocking for a whole slate of candidates um, for Minneapolis City Council. And in my ward, there was Andrea Jenkins, who was the first black trans woman to ever be elected to public office. She won that year along with a whole slate of other people. And it is those same people who first pushed for and then voted to actually defund the police in Minneapolis. So electing champions into public office is such an important part of what we can do right now, in addition to showing up and turning out to Juneteenth. And I wanted to share a little bit more about leaders, and Black leaders in particular, who are ready to fight for justice for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in office. The reality is right now, we are not seeing that like leadership that we need from so many politicians across the country. We need new leaders in city halls and in Congress who are actually going to fight for the Green New Deal and for a world where Black Lives Matter. We're really lucky right now to have two incredible Black leaders running for Congress who Sunrise has endorsed, who represent the kind of change we need. The first is Jamal Bowman, who is running for U.S. House in New York City, and the second is Charles Booker, who's running for U.S. Senate. And both of them have elections in just 12 days. There's a lot I could say about both of them. I've been phone banking for them, and it's been such an amazing experience. But I want to share about Jamal specifically, just for a little bit, to give you a sense of like the type of leader uh, Jamal and, and both of these men actually are. 
So Jamal uh, was a public school teacher for years and has been a community leader for decades. And when the COVID pandemic hit for the Bronx, he organized deliveries of food and medical supplies to those in need. And in the wake of George Floyd's murder, he has been in the streets alongside protesters to demand justice because as a black man, he born and raised in New York City, he actually knows firsthand the cost of militarized police and policies like stop and frisk. And meanwhile, his incumbent, um, the person who he's like running against, his name is Elliot Engel, and he this whole time has been in his suburban Maryland home. And on his first trip back to the district this week, some reporters asked him about what he thought about the protest, and he said, if I didn't have a primary, I wouldn't care. That is who he is running against. It is absolutely terrible. He literally doesn't even run in the district. Um, and Bowman right now is picking up momentum. He got endorsed by AOC. He got endorsed by Bernie in the last week. But at the same time, Engel hasn't had a serious challenger in years, and most people just do not know that there is an alternative, a progressive alternative. And that is where we come in. Last week, our field team sat down with the campaign and set a goal of making 400,000 calls before the end of the campaign, which will let us call every single target voter in the district two times. Last night, we, we set a sunrise record and we made 60,000 calls from in just one week. I'm oh, sorry, in what, just one night. Um, but we still have a really long way to go. And the next five days are especially critical because of coronavirus, because of COVID-19. Voters are really worried about getting to the polls in person, and many don't know that they can actually vote by mail. But the last day to request a ballot um, for voting by mail is this Tuesday. That's five days from now. So right now, I want to ask all of you to sign up for one shift between now and Monday for either Jamal or Charles Booker where in Kentucky, where Charles Booker is running. Uh, voters have until Monday to request their ballots. And I'm going to ask the, the chat moderation team to drop a link in the chat right now. It's just smvmt.org slash defund11. And you can see that right there. I'm seeing people signing up right now. And let's do the same thing. Like, as you're signing up, drop a smiley face in the chat. I am so hopeful about the potential of Jamal and Charles winning. It would mean so much to have these leaders in public office. Yes, I'm seeing those smiles rolling in. I love it. Um, and, you know, Jamal wanted to join this call to share more about his vision for the district and for the country, especially in this moment. But uh, he wasn't able to move his schedule around fast enough. But I did want to share a short clip from Tuesday's debate where the contrast between him and Elliot Engel literally could not have been clearer. Um, Cormac, can I ask you to uh, share this? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Yeah, you know, one slight correction to something uh, Congressman Engel mentioned. You know, he mentioned that things have changed over the last few weeks. But if you're African-American in this country, uh, things have not changed at all. Uh, we deal with institutional racism on a daily basis, and I've dealt with police brutality and police harassment my entire life. The first time I was beaten by police, I was 11 years old. A few years later, I was smacked around by police just for re being a boisterous young man. And it's something that we consistently deal with. So as we deal with and as we engage with police brutality as part of institutional racism, we have to engage with all institutional racism and where it exists in education, healthcare, housing, and environmental justice. The federal policy that we need to address involves immunity. Right now, right. police have immunity where if they violate someone's civil rights, the person is not allowed to sue them. Uh, that is unacceptable. We need to increase uh, police uh, accountability, not just in terms of ending that immunity, but also in terms of independent federal investigations. If the police committed a crime, we need the Department of Justice and the FBI to investigate uh, at, a, at a federal level. In addition, we need to reallocate resources that are going to militarizing the police. Elliot Engel supported the 1994 crime bill, which led to the militarization of our police force. We need to reallocate those resources toward nurses, teachers, mental health professionals, social workers, jobs, housing, and rebuild our communities so that they can be deep policed as opposed to being occupied by the police as we see it today. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Let's actually have people, uh, I'd love it if people could drop in the chat one thing you heard just now that you were really excited about. 
about Jamal sharing. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Same. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's so amazing to see Jamal speak, especially in this moment. Um, it's, you know, we see this, this massive uprising across the country and I am so red, I'm like sick and like fed up of railing against the people in power and I'm ready to have our own people in power who are actually going to listen and act to end the, the, the violence that, that is policing in this country. Um, so go ahead and keep on signing up for Jamal and I actually want us to take a second here and I want us to imagine that it's this time next year and Jamal Bowman is in Congress. I want to imagine what it would be like to have a black man who is not afraid to talk about his experiences with the police, not afraid to march with protesters, to call for defunding, able to speak up from the floor of Congress and call on our country to live up to its values. Jamal is in an uphill battle. Elliot Engel is one of the most powerful politicians in Washington. For months, the pundits wrote off Jamal as a long shot, but the events of the past weeks have changed everything. He's still the underdog, but he has a real shot to win this thing because there is so much grassroots energy behind his campaign, and we have to keep translating that grassroots energy into real phone calls. So one more time, the sign-up link is in the chat. It's smvmt.org slash defund11. Um, and I'm going to ask you one more time to just sign up for a shift between now and the last day when voters can register a request a ballot on Tuesday. I know it's scary. I still find it scary sometimes, but I swear getting on the phone with like real like voters who are uh, didn't know there was another option. They're able to be so excited that they actually can vote for someone who they believe in feels so meaningful, especially in this moment. And we will give you everything you need, a training, a script, uh, support of fellow Sunrisers. This is a moment with incredible potential, but it is only going to go our way with if millions of people step up and do things that they have never done before or that feel a little risky. And that means showing up on Friday next week for Juneteenth, and that means maybe get, spending a couple of hours getting on the phone and talking with people you don't know about candidates who could make a difference in all of our lives. Uh, I'm gonna pass it back to AOK -okay to just close this out with a couple of sentences but I would just encourage people to sign up and take that pledge to take action on Juneteenth, sign up and uh, sign up for some phone banking shifts as well. Okay, go for it. Thanks, Uru. You're a good guy. I'm personally a friend of, of Charles and he's a, he's a really authentic dude. Let's just end this with making one thing clear. This is about where our priorities lie. Over the past months, nurses risked their lives in trash bags while the cop army got face armor, body armor, shields and armored cars. The government always seems to find some money to assault young people on the streets, but our survival somehow is always too idealistic, too expensive. And why I, why I want you to get out on the streets about this, why I want you to stay on the streets, is because most of my life as a black man, I felt very alone. When I've been arrested for stealing the food I needed to eat, I felt very alone. When I get harassed in my own neighborhood by cops, I feel alone. When I get fired from jobs for speaking up as a black person, I, I feel very alone. And being at these protests, walking down the street and running into several protests a day, I no longer feel alone. And if you can just give that alone, then I think that's enough. And if we can keep moving forward, then if we can keep showing America a vision of the future, then we can build something even bigger. Make no mistake, the elites have always used racism to divide working people so that they can hoard the money, the power, and the wealth. But today is different. It's freedom time because for the first time in 50 years, maybe longer, maybe hundreds, we are seeing the country look at that narrative of racism and division and wake up, refuse to buy into it, take to the streets. And a fiercely multiracial, Black-led, Cross-class force is taking the nation by storm in every single state. Revel in this, this does not happen very often, if ever again, so you better be out there. There is no, there's no <laughs> option two, there's no redo. We have a chance to create a new common sense, one where the government prioritizes its people, one where we can see right through that racist rhetoric and demand what we deserve. A nation where people have safe streets and clean air, where we are guided by care for our neighbors and our community, that's the neighborhood we are see we're seeing build in cities everywhere. That's a nation we must continue to fight for. Juneteenth could be our chance to define real freedom for America, all Americans, all people in America. Electing Jamal and Charles could be our chance to rewrite the political rules for a new generation of progressive black leaders. So I'm gonna ask you one more time, please, will you sign up for that phone bank?
sunrisemovement.org, defund 11. Thanks y'all for coming. It's really a pleasure to be able to talk about this. It is a, a gift in my life to be able to bring this newer vision to see America's imagination expand. And I really appreciate y'all taking the time and going out on the streets and phone banking for these amazing black leaders.